Miss Cardew seems to be a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. Few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities, any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come over here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple, and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvellous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. Kindly turn round, sweet child. No, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. Chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on how the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon. Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care tuppence for social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. Dear child. Of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend upon. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Oh, do speak quite frankly. I am not in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. I beg pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell. But this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian. And she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I might almost say, an ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew, but the fact is, I do not approve at all of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew, Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London, on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I've just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brut 89, a wine I was specially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. What makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he was perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself this afternoon. Uh, um. After careful consideration, Mr. Worthing, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. That is extremely generous of you, Lady Bracknell. However, my decision remains unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Sweet child, come here. How old are you? Well, I'm really only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me for interrupting you again, Lady Bracknell. But I think it's only fair to tell you 
that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age till she is 35. That does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have of their own free choice remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which is many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not be even still more attractive at the age you mention than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, I know. But I do like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr Moncrief. My dear Mr Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait until she is 35, a remark which I'm bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But, my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage to Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware, sir, that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? The idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptised. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand, then, that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savour of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I am on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education. She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I've been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism. Come here, Prism. Prism. Where is that baby? Twenty-eight years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104 Grosvenor Square, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? <laughs> 